Welcome to Fairy Tale Access. Together, we will unravel the heroes, young and old, who turn dreams into reality. These are the people who still believe in fairy tales. Good morning. Welcome to Fairy Tale Access. Today, my guest is Mr. John Burkett. He is the head wrench hustler and rock on tour for Let's Put People on Bikes. This is an exciting story. Hi, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. My pleasure. So describe what you do with Let's Get People on Bikes. Basically what I do is I rescue bikes that people no longer want, could be sitting in a basement, could be sitting in a garage or closet. Uh, some of them are found in dumps, it could be along the street. Uh, so we rescue bikes, uh, I repair them, and then I distribute them through mostly through the Boys and Girls Club of Nashua or through the Nashua Soup Kitchen and uh, Shelter. Wow. And this is a retirement project? It is. Sense. I retired from Hewlett Packard mm -hmm. in 2005 and did some consulting for them. And in about 2009, I decided to do something different. I've always enjoyed riding bikes, but I couldn't repair them. So I found a school out in Ashland, Oregon, which was wonderful. It's a great little town. And I went out there and spent two weeks and got my certification as a bike technician and came back and said, well, what am I going to do with this now that I can repair bikes? And looking around, I found that one of the best things I could do is try and repair these things and give them away. Just like that. Just like that. Uh, I decided that I didn't want to try and do this as a full-time job. Mm -hmm. I'm happy being retired. I love waking up and being able to sleep in the morning if I want to or do what I want. But I did want something to keep me busy and something to give me a chance to uh, give back to the community. Wow. And now do you work for other people once in a while repairing bikes? I'll do, I'll do work for friends and family, mm -hmm. but that's really about it. I don't I'm not, I'm not trying to replace the local bike shops. This is strictly you know, me trying to, to keep some stuff going to the dump. My previous job with Hewlett Packard, for instance, was I was an environmental manager with them, mm -hmm. looking at what do you do with old electronics. Well, this is an extension of that to some extent. I don't want to see these old bikes going to, usable bikes going to the dump. And so if I can rescue those, then that would be great. Wow. Now, a lot of people have been helping you get these bikes, though. You're not just picking them up here and there. No, I, I have pretty much tapped out family and friends, people at my local church, uh, anybody I can, I can buttonholes. Uh, I was lucky enough to get a, have an article in the Nashua Patch in September, mm -hmm. which garnered a considerable amount of attention. So I still get phone calls from people there and emails from people there saying, I've got a bike, and... Rather than give it to the dump, would you want it? So I'm able to uh, to still continue to get those. Wow. Now, what did, how did you get um, the Boys and Girls Club or the Nashua Soup Kitchen as also a staff? Nashua Soup Kitchen is where I started. I get, I get their newsletter, and actually uh, Doug Brown, who had done some similar work in the past, I saw him mentioned in their newsletter saying that he was doing this, and I go, this is all coming together. I've got the training now. I see that he's been gathering bikes and giving them away through there. I met with him one meeting, and we talked a little bit. And since then, I've been doing essentially the same thing. Wow. So have people been donating bikes as they do. well? They do. I have, I have a couple of friends who tour the local dumps as they're, as they're doing things. If they find something usable, they may give me a call or take a chance that they can, they can use it. I have a number of friends who have cleaned out their basements and, <laughs> and garages. Uh, and then just whatever people have, have found me through the patch or through uh, Facebook or through our, our website. Oh, so you're on Facebook? Yes. What's your... So it's Let's Put People on Bikes on Facebook. Okay. And what about your webpage? That's uh, Let's Put People on Bikes.org. Fantastic. So people can go to either one of those places to donate bikes to you? They can, you? they can get the information for me, about me there, and then they can 
it'll give them the contact information. So you can either use John Burkett at gmail.com mm -hmm. or let's put people on bikes, all one word, at gmail.com. Both of those come to me, and I'm happy to respond to those. Plus, you'll find any other contact information you need on, on those two sites. And it gives you some background on what we're, what we're doing. Oh, great. So what happens to the bikes you get? What's, what are the main problems with bikes? It could be anything, uh, depending on someone who's had a bike for a while and just has stopped riding it but kept it in the garage. In some, some of those cases, it's a matter of I'll fill them up with air, make sure that the lubrication's done, and then they go out the door. Other ones, for instance, I got some a couple weeks ago where the weeds were growing through the, through the wheels. <laughs> no. So first you remove all the weeds and dirt and dust and things like that, and then do an evaluation. It could be a, almost a complete tune-up or a complete overhaul where you strip it down to all the parts, make sure they all work, put in grease, oil, where that's needed. It could be putting in new cables in, uh, making sure that whatever's loose is tightened, whatever's tight is greased, and then you can get it out the door. Wow. Are the chains on the bike the hardest thing to repair, or what's the hardest thing to repair on the bike? The chains, in some cases, if they've been outside way too long, it's, it's really tough to get those working again, so I have to replace those. Uh, the thing I replace the most would be tires and tubes mm -hmm. and cables. And cables? This would be shift cables or gear cables or, uh, or brake cables. Mm -hmm. Again, if they've been sitting too long, they, they tend to rust up. Oh, even if they're coated with the plastic? Yeah, what happens is it, they aren't always stainless steel, so the mild mm -hmm. steel will, will tend to rust and they become very solid. And it's, and it's quite difficult to get them to work. In some cases, it's just easier to clip them off and, and completely re-cable. Re Oh, are those cables recyclable? Um, for the most part, they're, they're, they're metal and some plastic. So, yeah, I recycle all that stuff. Oh, fantastic. And do you ever sell any of the bikes that you get? Only with the approval of the people I get the bikes from. Uh, the bikes I get tendly, generally tend to be old mountain bikes mm -hmm. or uh, hybrid bikes, the ones where people can actually sit up and ride as opposed to racing bikes. Okay. So if you, some, sometimes I get people who have had a hobby 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago, had a wonderful bike, may have been state of the art at that point, and they go, oh, this is my lovely bike, I don't use it anymore, do you want it? And it's a racing bike. The trouble is the people I'm giving them to really don't want those. Right. They're difficult to ride, they're difficult to shift. If they're in very good shape, <clears throat> then I'll ask them, do you mind if I try and sell this? And then I'll take any money I get from that and put it back into repairing other bikes. Fantastic. To date, I haven't really sold any. I've got a couple that are that should be ready in the spring, a couple Schwinn's from 19, 1970 oh, fantastic. that were almost pristine. I'm going to fix those up and see if I can find uh, buyers for those. Oh, that's it's a his and hers. So. A his and hers? Right. Oh, that's nice. Is there anything that you can't repair? Or any bikes that have been unrepairable? There are. There's some that have just reached the point where I can't get parts for them. I get a mi real mixture of high-end older bikes to not so high-end. And some of the lower-end bikes, it just becomes impossible. The parts are too bent. They're too rusted. In that case, I might take bikes and make them into parts bikes. So I'll take two, bar two bikes and make one, or three bikes and make one, and then recycle whatever parts I can't use. Wow. So is somebody getting a bike that's 15 different colors, or do you repaint them at the I end? I don't too? repaint them. They, you know, these, are me these mechanically sound when I, when I get, give them away through the boys' club, mm -hmm. boys and girls' club, and through the soup kitchen. I really don't repaint them. Okay. But that's great. They have a usable bike. It's, it's the whole key. Is it's, they, they can hop on it and ride. Well, and did you ride bikes growing up? I did. That was, for me, that was, the, I lived on a farm outside of town, and for me, that was, that was the great getaway. When I could hop on my bike as a kid, and all of a sudden, I wasn't bound to go where my folks wanted to go you know, to be, be with them. I could hop on a bike and go to school. I could go into town. I could do all kinds of things. So it's always meant... Get away from chores. Sure. Sure. But it's always meant freedom. <laughs> That's exactly right. And exercise. It must be it really is. good. It is. So I still bike quite a bit. Oh, fantastic. And here in Nashua, we have a lot of trails that people could use them on, right? We do. There's the, the Nashua River Rail Trail, and there's a, 
the trail goes from downtown out towards Simon Street, mm -hmm. and then you have Mines Falls Park, and um, Nashville is generally a pretty good downtown for biking. I haven't had too much problem biking there. Fantastic. So how do you distribute them? How do you decide which facility gets At which this bikes? point, I've been working, I started working with the, with the soup kitchen. Mm -hmm. And through them, they really aren't set up to take kids' bikes. And they suggested the Boys and Girls Club. And that's worked out very well. Because um, the Boys and Girls Club will take just about anything I can get for them. And they've, they've been very good about distributing those. Um, I have also distributed some through the Hudson Recreation Department. And if there's other organizations out there, I would love to talk to them and see if they have an opportunity to distribute these through other groups. I'd love to find a veterans organization or something like that to give back to the vets. Oh, fantastic. So, Where do you do your repairs? I have a dear friend, a wonderful lady, who <laughs> allows me to use her basement in Amherst. So tucked between the, uh, the furnace and the old paint cans, you'll find my shop. <clears throat> and just after I got back from the Oregon school, I found, I, I bought a number of tools, and on Craigslist I found a guy who did his own repairs and was getting rid of all his tools. And for a song, I picked up just pretty much everything I needed. That's fantastic. So I've got a couple what? thousand dollars of the equipment, because there, there are specialty tools required. So I was able to, to fully equip this, uh, my workshop, Mm -hmm. So I can make almost any repairs I need to now. Oh, that's great. And are there any bikes that you don't take? I generally don't take the racing bikes, just because that's not what, particularly the soup kitchen clientele, that's really not what they're looking for. They're looking for basic transportation to get them from, from home to a job to the doctor's appointment to yeah, just basic transportation, and the, and the racing bikes don't do that. In the Boys and Girls Club, <clears throat> their kids really don't want the racing bikes either. They, they want regular bikes or BMXs or something like that, but the racing bikes generally not so much. Okay, but you could still repair those if somebody gave it to you and then And then I could try and sell them. Sell. <clears throat> if they're in really good shape, I, I can try and sell them. Otherwise, it's just, it, <clears throat> the trouble is, is even if I get one that would only cost 100 bucks to repair, I can buy one in just as good a shape on Craigslist and if that's just money I don't, I don't have to put into them. I can put that into the other bikes, and it'll go far, a lot further. And are you registered as a nonprofit yet? I'm Even not. The, but you're not for profit. Uh, this is strictly self-funded. Mm -hmm. uh, I get some donations from, from family and friends. My Christmas cards were pretty good this year. Oh, that's great. Um, I also <clears throat> I play in a string in a jazz sextet. Any money I make doing that gets turned back over into uh, into the bikes. Wow! So you're the singing bike then? Well, this is I play I play bass. Oh, you so. play bass? Okay, so you don't sing. I don't sing. <laughs> okay. Um, how did the, when you donate the bikes? Have you ever seen how it affects the people that receive them? I talked. I don't actually see the clients that, that get these, but I do talk to the, the people I work with, both the soup kitchen and the uh, boys and girls club. In the soup kitchen, this could be almost anybody. They, I, I work through their education and employment advocacy group. <clears throat> and they're working with people who are having a hard time. And this could mean the difference between being able to look within walking distance for a job or for a doctor's appointment or for groceries mm -hmm. to now they can go a few miles further and they can carry stuff. So it could be almost anybody and Hopefully, it changes lives. That this is this is an improvement. Um, I've gotten some pretty good reports back that people are pretty thrilled when they get a chance to to get one of these things and and expand their horizons. Again, it's freedom. Absolutely. And again, just so everybody knows, where can they contact you to get a free or to donate a bike? Then, if they go on the website or. They, that's probably the easiest thing to do. They'll, all my contact information will be on there or at john.burkett at gmail.com. Just send me a note there, and then I'll get back with them, and we'll, we'll be able to pick up the bikes and, and, and fix them up. Great. 
And how many bikes do you personally own? I've got about six and a half. So I've got my touring bike and I've got a couple hybrids. I've got a road bike that I do. I've, my sister lives out in Illinois. I keep one in her house. And, and then I own half of a tandem. Wow. Do, do you participate in any races? Or? No. No? Uh, wow. This is either me going out for transportation. I do things like grocery shop on, with my bike. Uh, I do bike touring where you pack up everything on the back of the bike and go out, go out camping. Oh, wow. Which is fun. Not in the winter, right? <laughs> <laughs> Only the spring and summer in New England, right? I don't, I don't do that in the winter, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> wow, you're really extreme. And what else keeps you active in retirement? Although this seems like it would be enough to keep anybody active. You know, this, this keeps me as active as, as, as I wanted to. Um, some of the other things I do is, like I say, I play in this jazz sextet, the Wide Avenue cohort. Um, we appear around town occasionally in some of the venues around here. Uh, I do that. I'm very active in my church, the Unitarian Church downtown. Um, so between all that, that keeps me, keeps me going pretty well. Wow. What was your most unique experience on a bike? Oh my goodness. Um, <coughs> a couple of years ago, I went to um, Upper Michigan, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and did a 10 day bike tour there, which was pretty phenomenal. What happens on a 10 day bike tour? We went, we went about 500 miles. Mm -hmm. And from day to day, you, you find a place to camp. This is all set up through an organization called Adventure Cycling. Uh, they provide a, a tour guide, and all we do is tech, carry our stuff, and we go from campground to campground. Uh, we got through Sault Ste. Marie, we got through uh, Whitefish Bay, we got through a number of areas up there. It's, it's just, it's lovely doing that, and uh, just a lot of fun. Uh, we were very lucky it rained a lot during that trip, but not when we were actually riding. So oh, we were able to stop just before it rained or take off just after it stopped raining. Wow. What, what type of precautions do you take after it rains on a tour like that to dry down the bike to avoid rusting or sticking? Generally, for a, for a short tour like that, it wasn't too bad. I just make sure the bike is covered. 500 miles a short? Oh. You know, yeah, in 10 days, it's not bad. Okay. <laughs> you know, cover the bike at night so it's... So you keep most of the rain off of it, but that's about it. And then I did a tune-up when I got back. Oh, wow. What type of tool should somebody bring on a tour like that? Oh. Or is the tour guide <laughs> in charge of um, repairs? I can repair just about anything when I'm on tour, so I've got enough tools where I can change the, the, the chain if I need to. I've got spare spokes if I need to do that. I can take the wheels off. I carry spare tires and spare... Do you bring your tools. own bike? Hmm? You bring your own bike? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. They don't have bikes that you can rent for those tours? Or? You probably could. I prefer my own, though. I've got a, a wonderful touring bike I bought specifically for that trip, and I've, that's my main bike now. Wow. Like can, they be, can they be folded up for the airplane? Or I actually that? drove out there. You drove? Yeah. Wow. So then you drove, and then you took a five mile, 500 mile. mile. Right. You must be in really good shape. Do you also work out to keep up with the bike riding? I should. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So what goals do you have for put, let's put people on bikes? What are we going to do in 2014? Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity here. This, this allows me, gives me a little more uh, legitimacy so I can go talk to people about about finding more resources for bikes. You know, one of my goals is <clears throat> to have a steady supply coming in. Mm -hmm. um, but a steady supply, getting them all at once is a problem because storage is a problem. But having enough so I can work on a, a couple a week and turn them around and get them out to the soup kitchen, to the boys and girls clubs. So that's goal number one. How many do you get out a week? Or how many do you think you could get out a week? It depends on the bike because it takes... It could take anything from half an hour up to, up to a day to fix some of these bikes, uh, depending on what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. You can imagine some of these things have been sitting around for a long time. You may have to soak them for quite a while just to get the screws and the nuts to work oh, really? anymore. Wow. So I can, in some cases, it's 
happens quite a bit. In some cases, I actually have to cut pieces off in order to save them or to replace them. So <clears throat> it depends. It could be a half hour. It could be eight hours on, a, on one bike. So it's, uh, it's definitely not the same type of work you'd have in a bike shop. So the goal is to get more bikes in, and you want to distribute them to... Right, I continue distributing them through the Boys and Girls Club and through the uh, soup kitchen to find other organizations that would help distribute them. Okay. Um, so eventually... New, so new, new organizations to help distribute them That would be to, great. And so, is it mostly to kids, or is it adults, too? Is it, the Boys and Girls Club is strictly to kids. The, um, the soup kitchen is to adults. Oh, great. <clears throat> putting the whole family on bikes. That would be great. Getting them moving. Now, That's... another goal of, in, the, in the far future, depending on how things go, is to become a, a real charity. So I can give people, you know, <clears throat> their tax right off for the end of the year and do that. That's, that's quite a ways off. I enjoy repairing bikes. I'm not crazy about doing the idea of, of you know, doing an administration. Mm -hmm. Wow. And if you could get a message out to, to the recipients of the bikes, what would you say to them? A couple things. Number one, I hope that these bikes help in some small way to be an improvement to your life. Mm -hmm. And secondly, when your life does get better, give the bike to pass it on to somebody else who can use it in the future or figure out some way of getting it back to me. I'll fix it up and we'll, we'll give it another new life and help somebody else out. That's fantastic. So do you find that there's a lot of bikes? What's the oldest bike that you've worked on? I've gotten things from the 50s and 60s. Oh, wow. Uh, majority of stuff I get is from the uh, 80s and 90s. But um, like I say, I've got those two Schwinns from about 1970, which I'm pretty excited about. So it, does that make it, oh, no, 1970? Is that in the antique market yet? I'm not sure. How, do they, how do they gauge those? Is it? No, I think it has to be 50 years old. Yeah. But that's exciting. And they still, in the 70s, they can still work really well. They still make parts that will work with those. Mm -hmm. These particular ones I'm thinking about aren't going to need very much. They're probably going to need new, new tires and new tubes. Um, and that's easy enough to change those. The finish on those and everything else is, is really pretty good. So I'm, they were very well taken care of, and they probably haven't been ridden in the better part of 30 years. So. And they're still rideable. Do you test drive all of them? I do. I want to make sure that when they go out the door, they're, they're very rideable. Oh, maybe something else you should put on your agenda is teaching other people how to do their maintenance on their bikes so they I, can I pass think, them along. I think that would be a great idea. I'd, I'd also welcome anybody else that, that wants to do similar stuff. I mean, there's, I, this, is a, this is a need I don't think I can fill by myself. So the help I could use is, number one, helping me find the source for bikes. Number two, I will take donations if, if somebody's so moved. Another thing is if somebody wants to do this on their own. You know, this is, like I say, it's a need that I don't think can ever be filled. So what if somebody found a used bike that they really wanted for themselves? Could they ask you to pay for it so that the money would go directly towards helping you get bikes out? Um, if they wanted me to pay for it? No, no, no. If they paid for it and, and then, they paid you to do it. Like I say, I do this for, for close friends and for family. If it, it, I'm really not trying to replace the, the local bike shops. Okay. So the best way for people to participate is to bring in bikes that you right, can repair. Right, and help me find them, and uh, that would be great. And help you find people to give them to. Yep, and pass the word. So if, there, if somebody knew of a child in need, they could describe it and send you a note? What I do with, the, with that, because I do get those occasionally, mm -hmm. uh, is I try and pass those on to the agencies I work with. Okay. So I don't give them out directly. I, I do work just exclusively through the agencies. Fantastic. And you just came up with it again. How? <laughs> how did you decide that? When I retire from working at these really cool places, I'm going to repair bikes just because I, I enjoyed tinkering, and mm -hmm. I enjoyed the bikes, and I enjoyed riding quite a bit. And like I say, when I saw the stuff from the soup kitchen, where this, where Doug Brown had been doing similar things, you know, it did kind of click. I mean, you know, I've, I've got the training now. Uh, 
and they found a need, and so it, it clicked and it all came together. So that made sense. And this is, again, it allows me to give something back to the community. Fantastic. And have you, when you were at school, did you meet other people that are doing similar things or? Almost all of them were going to work for bike shops. Mm -hmm. um, and they're going to school specifically. M most of them already work there or they're looking to find jobs in, in bike shops. Uh, biking in America has, has got a, a new golden age and so you're seeing more people on bikes. So I think you're seeing more opportunity out there for, for repair. Absolutely, because it keeps you healthy. It's a great exercise routine. Oh, sure. And you get to see new places. <laughs> and escape. It's a good escape. Is there anything that we missed that we should tell our viewers about? Not that I can think of. I think we've covered almost everything there. Um, just I'd be happy to talk to people about it. And um, I could, like you said, I'm the rack on tour. So. <clears throat> head wrench because I'm the only I'm the only guy repairing the bikes with, yeah, there. Uh, hustler because I'm doing all the hustling to make sure things happen. And rack on tour, I'm telling stories about it whenever I can. That's fantastic. It's a great byline. I love it. So let's put people on bikes, and they can contact you at let's put people on bikes dot org org and also at Facebook. Let's right. put people on bikes. Yeah, if you just look it up on Facebook, I'm, that'll be, I'll show right up. Fantastic. So anybody who might have received a bike could post a picture on Facebook? That would be neat. I've, ne I've never actually seen somebody riding one of the bikes, but I know they've been distributed, so it'd be neat to see one of those. That's fantastic. Well, thank you for such a wonderful volunteer project that you do in the community and for sharing with us. I think it's exciting. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. Oh, my pleasure. So everybody out there, keep asking questions. And let's put more people on bikes. Contact John at letsputpeopleonbikes.org or on Facebook, same title, and see where we can take this. Until next time, keep asking questions.